your Royal Highness, County Governor, Chief of Police, guests and participants of effects of climate change on the world ocean. As we are gathered here in Bergen, fisherman Holger Pedersen from the iconic Lofoten area is worried. He is an experienced participant in the traditional skreifiske. This seasonal fishery has for more than 1,000 years served Norway and the rest of the world with cod and stockfish. Now, Holger Pedersen sees changes. The cod is heading north and the season shifts. The fishing fleet, if anyone, knows that Mother Nature is unpredictable. They have learned to live with natural variations. But now times are different. In addition to natural variability, man-made climate changes comes on top. And with a business as usual scenario, we are now heading towards a three degree global warming. A scenario that we really don't want to come true. However, changes will affect us in any scenario. Our ways of living, where we settle, what resources we will come to depend on. In short, how we manage as citizens and as a society. Fisherman Holger embodies this. He's worried and he needs to know how is my life and my family affected? Will Lofoten and the Skrei fishery remain as we know it or will it fade into history? Thousand kilometers separates Bergen and Lofoten, but never has this distance been shorter. Because some of the answers that Holger seeks may be addressed here in the coming days. This conference, your knowledge, your work, and not least your solutions are in highly demand. The urgency is unquestionable. I'm so proud that the IMR, Bergen, and Norway is a part of ECHO 5, and this worldwide chain of state of the art of science and scientists. You deliver the science we need for the ocean we want, And I'm also very grateful to have His Royal Highness Crown Prince Håkon Magnus here to open the Equo 5. I dare say His Royal Presence indeed underlines the importance of this conference. So again, I'm honored and privileged to give the floor to His Royal Highness. Please. County Mayor, Mayor, dear participants, please join me in a short uh, imaginary trip. Try to see yourself standing on an endless white surface on a crisp and clear morning. The world around you is completely covered in snow and ice. Everything is white. You are in the middle of the vast ice cap. The horizon ends in a light blue line 
slowly transforming into the bluest shade imaginable. The spring sun is shining around the clock as it does this far north in the spring. It is cold, minus 20. The silence is total, only interrupted by gusts of wind, a little bit cold, that wind. You are absorbed by nature. I have been lucky enough to be there. In May last year, I had the opportunity to join an expedition on Greenland, organized by the Arctic University of Norway in Tromsø. We were seven participants traveling from Ilulissat to Danneborg on the east side. The purpose of the expedition was to spread awareness about polar history and the important research being conducted in the Arctic. I could also take you inside our crowded tent where you had no alternative but to get along, where we woke up on freezing mornings a little bit sore from the day before. I could describe the stiffness in my arms or especially actually in my hands some of those days. Still, what I remember most vividly is the feeling of being alone, embraced by this gigantic, enormous nature. Knowing that under my skis, there were three kilometers, 3,000 meters of ice. I'm sure that many of you have similar experiences with the ice and the snow, with the cold, with harsh environments in the Arctic or Antarctic. Many of you have perhaps felt the powerful presence of wildlife either on land, on ice, or in the ocean. The feeling of being surrounded by nature, of something that feels endless. Yet it is not. It is possible to cross Greenland in two weeks on skis and with kites. The enormous mass of ice is not infinite, as we know. It is melting. And I imagine that all of you, like me, are afraid to lose the feeling of nature's magnitude, the feeling of connecting when you immerse yourself into nature. For me, being in the wild, at sea, in the snow, in the forests, the mountains, it's existential. It is the feeling of being at home. These are defining times where we need science more than ever. We need the knowledge, the numbers, and the thorough studies. We need wise and concerned scientists in our collective search for truth. And I'm glad to, that you decided to organize this conference here in the city of Bergen at the vital west coast of Norway. Norwegians have for centuries been, Nor Norwegians have for centuries been a nation living by and off the ocean. And Bergen was and is a natural hub, hub for everything connected to the sea. Effects of climate change on the world's ocean. ECWO is the fifth symposium in the series. Your name and the conference theme has never been more essential. It is impressive to gather more than 500 scientists and participants from almost 70 countries. It says something about the importance and the scope of this conference. My congratu congratulations go to the organizers and especially to the Norwegian Institute of Maritime Research. Climate change has a wide range of effects on the ocean. And here are some of the major findings related to our near waters. The Barents Sea is one of the ocean is one of the ocean areas most heavily affected by global warming, and research shows a marked reduction in ice cover. There is an increase in the production of uh, phytoplankton due to the decreased ice cover and marked northern wood distribution of range of fish species, including cod. Further south, the cod stock in the North Sea and along the Norwegian coast is declining as the temperature is getting too high and suboptimal for the reproduction. The sugar kelp forests outside southern Norway are already strongly affected with dramatic die-off due to warming. In the last IPCC report, kelp forests were among the most at-risk ecosystem types 
only surpassed by warm water corals. This illustrates the great span in the challenge that climate change affects both the tropics and the polar ecosystems. Knowledge and research must be at the core of how we deal with climate change. You, our researchers, make the critical knowledge accessible. Your work enables us to create a, a, a sustainable future because you give us the means to make the right decisions. Having forums such as this symposium is central to ensuring the dialogue between scientists and inspire great science in the years to come. And I am glad to see that there are many young scientists here today as well. Your conference is also an important part of the larger One Ocean Week here in Bergen. More than ever, we need meeting places like this, where scientists meet politics, business, public administration and culture. Settings like this week in beautiful Bergen is a perfect arena for creating enthusiasm and hope. Over the last years, I have met many of your colleagues and I'm often impressed by scientists. Your passion and your commitment to nature and thereby to all of us as a global community. Your creativity, dedication and persistence always inspire me. Thank you for your hard work and I wish you a fruitful symposium. Thank you. Thank you very much, Your Royal Highness, for very interesting thoughts and perspectives. And now I am happy to introduce the local co-convener, Professor and Research Director at IMR, Geir Huse. The professor. Thank you, Nisgano. Your Royal Highness, Excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's great to see you all this morning. Um, I would like to invite the Mayor of Bergen, Lynn Christine Anger, to the stage for welcoming remarks. So please, Mayor. Your Royal Highness, dear everyone, it is such a pleasure to see that so many have traveled to our city between the seven mountains. And I wish you all a warm welcome to Bergen. Norwegians, especially we on the West Coast, as the Crown Prince mentioned, have always lived off, by, and on the ocean. It was on the basis of sea trade that Bergen became the most important economic area in Norway and the capital of our country in the 12th century. In the mid-13th century, Bergen also became an important European trade city, as Bergen became part of the Hanseatic network, a network that at its height included over 170 cities and ports worldwide. Through centuries, the oceans have brought us food, trade, transport, employment, and love. They have carried goods, people, and new ideas. And they have connected cultures and collaboration across the globe so that we became more enlightened and better equipped to face our challenges. This is an important part of our tradition, a tradition that you and this conference definitely continue by bringing over 600 experts from almost 70 countries here to Bergen to discuss one of the most pressing issues of our time. The same conference as we are attending now has been held previously in Spain, South Korea, Brazil, and United States. And I'm really proud that it's Bergen's turn now. Through 19 sessions over five days, you will improve the understanding of how climate change affects and changes the ocean's ecosystem and what we must do to save them. As you here today know, perhaps better than anyone, our biggest ecosystem is in danger and its, time is in short, and its time is in short supply. If we are to continue our history of living with and by the sea, we must change how we treat our ocean. 
The oceans we have to save are enormous, but so are the opportunities that lie within. Opportunities that can give us energy, food and life for centuries to come. All this is possible if we choose to pick the right way forward and succeed in protecting our common treasures. But action is urgent, and it has been for a long time now. The number of human beings increases every day, the sea level is rising, and our way of living and using resources exceeds our planet's tolerance. One of Norway's most known writers, Björnstjern Björnsson, who died 113 years ago, once wrote, of all nature, the ocean has the most to tell. Now we know that to be true. Life on the planet is far from fully discovered. Just under two million animal species have so far been described by science, but it is estimated that there are around 10 million multicellular organisms. The greatest discoveries await in the sea. Forms of life that we did not know existed until recently are constantly being discovered in the ocean. And even large creatures that live quite close to the coast are often unknown to us. Norway has the world's second longest continuous coastline, beaten only by Canada. And our long coastline makes it extra exciting to think about what we have left to discover. Because the ocean have always tied Bergen and the Bergen region to the rest of the world. As mentioned, we have a long history as an international trading and shipping hub. Trade was and is the rhythm and the pulse of our city. And through hundreds of years, the oceans have connected us. Today, we are proud to have among the world's leading knowledge institutions and researchers here in Bergen and in Western Norway as well as forward-leaning business community with the will, desire and means to make a difference. The research director of the Institute of Marine Research, HUSA, has said, I hope and believe we will all get some eureka moments when we get together and see all the research side by side. I really do hope for the same. And I also hope that you all have a really nice stay in Bergen and an eye-opening and inspiring conference. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much, Mayor, for that inspiring uh, welcome address. So the, um, the effect of, of climate change um, on the world's ocean was launched in 2008 in uh, Guillaume, in Spain by the, inter, um, by the International Council for the Exploration of the Sea, ICS, um, the North Pacific Marine Science Organization, PISES, and the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission of the UNESCO, IOC. And to address the uh, urgent need for information on changing seas. Since then, we've had three more symposia um, in South Korea in 2012, in uh, Brazil in 2015, and in Washington in 2018. And now we meet in Bergen. So the um, ACFO uh, conferences has been of very high quality and um, this year, and, and very well um, uh, attended. And this year we have actually uh, managed to gather 760 uh, participants, of which a third is actually online. So this whole uh, meeting is, uh, is also streamed. Um, so, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC, recently concluded that the science now document the climate is changing faster and the impact is stronger and the conclusions are with more certainty than previously reported. So the theme of this conference has never been more important. And science has a critically important role in providing information about the effect of climate change on the world's ocean ecosystem and human livelihoods, ecosystem resilience to change, and effective uh, uh, mitigations and uh, adaptation measures. And these are core themes of uh, this conference. And having meeting places such as uh, ECFO is critical to facilitate dialogue, 
to introduce uh, new uh, uh, ocean professionals to the science community and to inspire great work um, in the years to come. So, as in the previous years, ACFO 5 is organized jointly by a local uh, organizing uh, organization and four international uh, organizations dealing with the ocean. So, IMR has already been introduced by uh, CEO uh, Nils Gunnar, and now we would like to have uh, the four organizations represented for them to the stage to give us some introductory remarks. So, I would first like to um, uh, welcome uh, Dr. Sonia Batten, uh, Executive uh, Secretary for Pisces, to the stage. So, please, uh, Sonia. Your Royal Highness, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it is a very great pleasure to welcome you on behalf of Pisces to this symposium in the beautiful city of Bergen, where the sun clearly always shines. <laughs> Pisces has been involved in all of the five ECHO uh, conferences to date. It's one of the most important conference series that we co-convene. Because the science shared at these events fits so well with Pisces' purpose, and this is to promote and coordinate marine research in the North Pacific and its adjacent seas, to advance scientific knowledge about the ocean environment, global weather and climate change, living resources and their ecosystems, and the impacts of human activities, and to promote the collection and rapid exchange of scientific information on these issues. And although Pisces focuses the North Pacific, we know that there really is only one ocean, and the issues facing it and us are global in their scope, and they need global conversations, actions and solutions. I'm very much looking forward to hearing progress on these through this week from all of you. Before handing over to my colleagues uh, to give their welcome, I wanted to share a message with you from one of the planet's greatest ambassadors. During our planning, we reached out to Sir David Attenborough. We were aiming high, no offense to our excellent keynote speakers. <laughs> <laughs> and I received this reply, Dear Sonia Batten, I'm greatly complimented that you should invite me to speak at your conference. I regret to say, however, that being now 96 years of age, I am no longer able to accept such invitations. Nevertheless, I wish the conference every success in its deliberations. Yours sincerely, David Attenborough. This is my favorite rejection letter, and I have had a few. <laughs> but I too wish us every success this week. Thank you for coming to ECHO 5. Thank you very much, Sonia. Um, next, I would like to have uh, Dr. Vera Agostini, Deputy Director uh, of FAO uh, Fisheries and Aquaculture, please. Your Royal Highness, Excellencies, colleagues, friends, it is really a pleasure to be a part of this opening ceremony. Not only am I a fisheries, uh, climate fisheries scientist by training, but the Pisces community has played a vital role in my early days, providing inspiration and networks as I was moving my first steps as a PhD student at the University of Washington. So it's really a pleasure to be here. It feels like a coming home, and I very much look forward to catching up with old friends and making some new ones. And I was also reflecting as I was coming in yesterday, what is there not to be excited about coming to a country that has tall ships and fish on their currency? My heaven. So uh, FAO is a United Nations, United Nations agency that is focused on food security and plays a vital role to help strengthen the science policy interface. We follow very closely any scientific progress that helps to understand the stressors, the impact that these have on aquatic food sectors. Why are we doing this? The stakes are high. We will not be able to end uh, hunger, worldwide hunger, without aquatic foods. So we follow all this very closely. Let me give you some numbers so that you understand the importance of this. Food production is growing at twice the rate of population growth in the, in the, in the recent decades. Also, 600 million people worldwide rely in some way, at least partially, on fisheries and aquaculture. So it is for this reason that the Paris Agreement really invites, requires solutions that do not threaten aquatic food system. Now, there, there is no doubt that ocean-dependent communities are a critical part for successful ocean climate solutions. 
FAO's adaptation program works with communities and countries worldwide to help design solutions that are science-based and participatory. Now, effective ocean climate solutions also rely on diverse collaborations and partnership. And this meeting is an excellent opportunity to lay those, to, to help uh, nurture those. Um, by working together, we can achieve solutions. We can help communities and countries adapt. Um, it, it is, this is critical, and we are here. This is fantastic. It's a great opportunity to do that, and we will be able to ultimately achieve what FAO calls a blue transformation. I look forward to the conversations in the next few days, and I wish you all a successful meeting. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vera. Uh, next, we'd like to have Dr. Henrik Oxfeldt Envolsen, Head of S uh, Center, IOC UNESCO, please. Thank you very much, Your Royal Highness, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission of UNESCO, a warm welcome to all participants to this fifth international symposium. The IOC Secretariat is proud to have been co-organizing these symposia since the first, which you've already heard, was held in 2008 in Gijón in Spain. This symposium is important to us as the United Nations Agency for supporting global ocean science and services. We strive to connect science to policy and strengthen the full value chain from research to solutions for the ocean. I'm confident that this symposium will connect disciplines, facilitate new partnerships, and co-design of innovative research on the effects of climate change on the ocean. It also gives opportunities for new engagement of the scientific community, that's you, and co uh, of the science community, which is you, in this value chain from research to solutions for this ocean we want and need. And as already pointed out, time is short. It's very encouraging to see that several programs and projects of the UN Decade for Ocean Science for Sustainable Development are already presenting their science at this symposium. It's a pleasure to be here in Bergen, and it's also an opportunity, I think, to express acknowledgement to Norway for its strong and outstanding international commitment for a healthy ocean at many levels and in many fora. I wish you a successful conference. Thank you. Thank you very much, Henrik. Um, and last but not least, Dr. Jörn Smith, Chair of the Science Committee at ISIS. Thank you very much, uh, Your Royal Highness, Excellencies, uh, colleagues and friends. Um, it's really wonderful to see you all here in the room and online. And uh, firstly, I must thank Norway and IMR to host the conference in this wonderful and, as we just learned, always sunny Bergen. And uh, secondly, it's my pleasure to also welcome everyone on behalf of the International Council for the Exploration of the Sea, ICES. We are also one of the organizations that have uh, co-organized these conferences, conference series from the very beginning on. And the work on climate change conducted globally and also presented here at the conference is essential to understanding how our changing climate is impacting the ocean and the ecosystem it supports. IC's mission is to advance and share scientific understanding of marine ecosystems and the services they provide, and to use this knowledge to generate state-of-the-art advice, so translating the science into advice uh, to those that need to make decisions for meeting conservation, management, and sustainability goals. To do this, we bring together scientists from different disciplines, not only natural sciences, but also social sciences and the humanities, we conduct the work, for example, through our joint ICES Pisces Strategic Initiative on Climate Change. Uh, we just published a report on pathways to climate related advice. And of course, we brought all you here to Bergen or online uh, to attend the fifth international symposium on the effects of climate change on the world ocean. And we already heard uh, that there are a lot of early career scientists in the room, and we actually have over 300 registered early career scientists to the conference, which is almost half of all of the participants. Promoting and supporting the work of early career scientists is key to our work. And our organizations 
have collaborated to support the travel of 65 of those early career scientists to attend this conference. Only through collaboration we can improve our understanding of climate change effects, explore effective mitigation and adaptation strategies, and lay the scientific foundations to ensure the long-term sustainability of our oceans and the valuable resources therein. So thank you very much um, that you're all here and share your science and exchange. And I'm really looking forward to this week of scientific exchange and networking. And um, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jörn, and to all of you for those uh, uh, great uh, introductory comments and for continued support for the ECWO uh, Symposium. We would also like to take the opportunity to thank the Scientific Steering Committee for this conference and the session conveners for doing a great job in developing the science uh, program. Okay, we now move on to some keynote uh, presentations. The first speaker is Dr. Uh, Randy Ingvalsen from uh, IMR. Um, she is a senior scientist at our institute here in Bergen, working with uh, polar oceanography, climate variability and change, and climate impacts on single species and marine ecosystems. Focus areas are the Barents Sea and adjacent Arctic Ocean, and uh, she has co-authored more than 60 uh, peer-reviewed papers and seven book chapters. And uh, Dr. Ingvaldsen is also involved in integrated ecosystem assessment and advice. So we will look very much forward to your presentation, Randy. The floor is yours. Your Royal Highness, Excellencies, dear participants, it's a great, great pleasure for me to have this keynote today on Atlantification and Borealization of the Barents Sea and the adjacent Arctic Ocean. The Barents Sea <coughs> lies north of the northernmost part of the Norwegian mainland. It is bounded in the south by the Norwegian Sea uh, and in the north by the Arctic Ocean. Uh, the yellow to purple colors on this map show mean sea surface temperature uh, and it's used to ex as an example to show that uh, warm, relatively warm Atlantic water comes in from the North and North Atlantic and then flow through our, uh, the Norwegian Sea and the Barents Sea while it's being cooled on its way due to heat loss to the uh, atmosphere. When it comes into the northernmost regions, uh, it flows under the sea ice, which is shown in this figure by the blue to white uh, colors. The Barents Sea can then be visualized or viewed at as having two domains, a warm uh, uh, Atlantic, uh, a southern warm Atlantic domain characterized by the relatively warm Atlantic water change coming in from the south, and a northern Arctic domain which is characterized by the seasonal sea ice cover. As you've heard, there are large changes in this sea ice cover. Uh, there's strong uh, sea ice loss in winter in the Barents Sea, and I just emphasize this is in winter, it's not uh, the summer sea ice cover, that's most dramatically changing in the Arctic. Uh, the thin uh, green lines here show observations, it shows this uh, very strong uh, negative trend over the last 45 years. The thick lines are model projections. Um, the, the historical model projections don't really fully capture the decline, but it shows a negative decline. Uh, what the red and black uh, lines show, the projections into the future, uh, they show that the sea ice loss will continue, uh, although the rate and magnitude of this will obviously depend on which kind of emission scenarios we choose to follow. There are also uh, large changes in warming in these northern regions, uh, both in the ocean and in the atmosphere. Uh, this figure here is exemplified by the atmospheric changes. This shows decadal mean sea surface uh, temperature trends. Uh, it's yellow or red, it's positive in the entire Arctic, so there's warming in the entire Arctic. But the largest changes are actually occurring in the northern Barents Sea and the adjacent uh, Arctic Ocean. This is in the region where the Atlantic water uh, is sitting closest to the sea ice. So, what changes do we see in the Atlantic water coming in from the south? Uh, the numbers on this map show decadal trends, uh, again, in the Atlantic water temperature. They are positive all the way from the south, meaning that warmer water is coming into our region, but the trends are increasing, or there are largest trends in the north, meaning that the warming is actually amplified through our regions before uh, entering the Arctic. 
Uh, this is because an atmosphere warmer than before cools the northward flowing water less efficiently. And it means that more heat uh, is brought into the Arctic by the Atlantic water. So, if we want to look in a little bit more detail on the Barents Sea, what do we actually see? see? What is the characteristics? This southern uh, Atlantic domain has become warmer and it has expanded. The northern or Arctic domain uh, has consequently become less, a bit smaller, and with less sea ice. But there are also important changes in the water column. And what you see on the top uh, of, uh, towards the surface in this figure, is that there are different water layers in the water column. Uh, these are different water layers that actually separate the sea ice from the Atlantic water, which is further down uh, in, the, in the layer. And what we see is that there is a weaker stratification between these water layers. And what is stratification? <laughs> stratification or layering occur due to different density of the fluid. Uh, it's more easily visualized in cocktails than in, in water. But the point here is that weaker stratification between more mixing between the different layers. So if we return to the Arctic, what does that mean then? The weaker stratification means that more heat uh, is brought from the Atlantic water, or more heat from the Atlantic water will reach the sea ice. That means again that there's less sea ice. Well, less sea ice actually means a weaker stratification, a weaker stratification again, meaning that this is a loop, a feedback loop, right? So it starts and it will keep going. If we then add to this that with less sea ice, more heat is observed from the sun in summer, which again returns to less, causes less sea ice. So there really are powerful feedbacks in this region. The, that's the point. The, these powerful feedbacks amplify the warming and the sea ice loss, and that's why we see such large changes in the Arctic. This then causes the uh, ice-covered, cold and stratified Arctic domain to, close, to more closely resemble the warmer and uh, ice-free Atlant Atlantic domain, and that's why we call this term Atlantification. So, now we've seen that there are changes, in the, the changes in the physical system, and then what are the associated changes in the marine ecosystems? If we start with the species associated with sea ice, the sea ice is uh, reducing, is, uh, which obviously has very clear negative consequences for the uh, species associated with it. So, there is a clear habitat loss for the ice ecosystem ice-associated species, which is dramatic. The situation is uh, slightly different if we then look at the uh, pelagic systems and the water masses further south in the Barents Sea. Uh, the primary producers uh, have been, the primary produ production has increased. Um, this figure show uh, primary production over the last 20 years in the Barents Sea. The point is that uh, less sea ice leads to more open water and a longer growing season for phytoplankton, which then ret give in return a strong increase in net primary production for the, for the last 20 years, for well, the period where we have data. Uh, similar changes or positive changes are also seen, as already mentioned, for some of the top predators, like, for example, the commercial um, important barren sea cod. With warming and sea ice loss, uh, the suitable feeding area for cod will expand, uh, has expanded. That means that, the, when, when, as already mentioned, the warm southern Barents Sea has expanded. It means that cod can use more of the Barents Sea. When it can use more of the Barents Sea, it can actually sustain a, a larger stock. So the total stock biomass are actually increasing. However, because cod has to go into the, to the Norwegian coast to spawn, this also means that it, has, it, it gets a longer migration, migration length and speed. So the improved conditions for, there are improved conditions for cod, but at the energetic cost of lengthier and faster spawning migrations. And the, uh, and the uh, full knowledge on this, how this changes in spawning migration actually will affect, we don't really know yet. It's not only 
cod that's actually are expanding northwards. Uh, if we look at all fish species, uh, we can see quite a lot of the same. This map here shows uh, fish species when they're categorized into either boreal communities or Arctic fish communities. The red dots in the south are the boreal fish. Uh, the blue ones in the north are the Arctic fishes. And the situation here is, uh, is shown in 2004. If we then compare it to the situation in 2017, uh, we clearly see that there is a northward range expansion of the boreal species. The red and the white dots are, having far, are getting far north, but on the expense of the Arctic fish species. So the Arctic fish species in the north are actually are having, uh, losing their habitat, and at the same time they are coming boreal species into the region. Such northward range expansions will also actually affect the, the uh, food web because the Arctic fish species are small and specialized feeders while the boreal fishes has a much wider uh, diet. And that means that they're much more feeding on different species. There are more feeding links in the ecosystem. These changes might then affect the connectivity in the ecosystem. This figure is then now showing feeding links, the number, of, uh, the number of prey that the species are actually feeding on. You see a high number of feeding links in the southern Barents Sea. It's from 2004 again. There is a low number of feeding links in the northern Barents Sea. Comparing to 2017, we see that now there is a moderate number of feeding links in the northern Barents Sea. So the point is the ecosystem or actually the food web are changing. There is more uh, predation by boreal species in the northern Barents Sea. This progressively more connected Arctic food web gives rise to new pathways of energy and material flow. And the observed change goes in the direction of increased capacity to adjust to the Atlantification, but at the cost of the Arctic species. Similar uh, results were found when investigating impacts of near future climate change on the stock productivity. Uh, this study is uh, showing the uh, uh, changes in the all the Norwegian regions, but I want to focus on the Barents Sea now. Uh, what it shows is that the Arctic stocks involved in this study, that was polar cod and snow crab, will likely be negatively impacted in the near future while the boreal stocks um, are predicted to do well, at least, for, as I said, for the near future. On the, yeah, in the near future. That brings me to the summary. Um, the oceanic changes uh, in this region include warming, sea ice loss, and a weaker stratification. Uh, and the changes are to a large degree caused by a stronger influence of the Atlantic water. The processes involved in this uh, include warmer Atlantic water coming in from the south, uh, less efficient cooling of the ocean when this Atlantic water is flowing towards north, and then very powerful feedbacks amplifying the warming and sea ice loss in the um, sea ice region in the northern regions. If we look at the ecosystem, this figure shows the northern Barents Sea in the past and in the and at present. So the impacts of the Arctic ecosystems associated with this Atlantification, higher production in the regions that are becoming free of ice, northern expansion of the boreal species, that's why we call it borealization, reduction uh, of the Arctic species, uh, and a more connected food map. So what about the future? What do we expect for the future? We know it will be warmer uh, and with less ice. Uh, we think the Atlantic, it's likely that the Atlantification and, and the borealization will likely progress. But the magnitude and the speed of the changes are associated with uncertainties. Of course, depending on uh, the scale of the climate model, which uh, scenarios that are, they are forced with, and the adaptions of, of the ecosystem. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Rande, for that uh, insightful presentation on the dramatically changing uh, Arctic. So uh, the next speaker is uh, Dr. Christian de Clovers. 
Um, he is a Belgian photographer, explorer, public speaker and author. Uh, his work covers the polar regions and uh, oceans, including some of the most remote islands on the planet. Uh, Christian believes in the power of the image, showing what is at stage, stake, uh, as well as the consequences of human footprints by documenting, witnessing, and capturing. We look very much forward to your presentation. The floor is yours, Christian. Your Royal Highness, Your Ex Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much also for this uh, very uh, meaningful um, conference. I'm uh, honored to be here today. <clears throat> so it's a bit of a long title, but what I do is I believe in the power of image. I think image is still quite underestimated. Politicians on one, on one side, they speak their language of policy papers, strategy papers, and so on. And then scientists come with very significant reports. What I try to do is bridging the gap in between with image, through image, going to the front line of climate change and really documenting what is at stake, documenting impact in a direct way or indirect way through image or documenting vulnerability and just the last beauty that uh, remains on the planet. So I have a short film to start with. I think I have to press again. Yeah. My name is Christian Klaus. I'm an ocean and polar photographer with a mission. Nature is who we are. Curiosity drives me to explore wild, remote places. In this vast silence, I feel at home, filled with passion and gratitude. I contemplate my place in the universe. I recharge. This is my way of life. Everything started when I entered the Svalbard Global Seed Vault, a bunker in the high Arctic drilled deep into the permafrost to preserve the global biodiversity of our food crops for future generations. The ever-increasing tension between man and nature immediately struck me. It became my life's goal to explore this relationship and tension, to document impact and to raise awareness. Even the least inhabited, most remote and pristine areas of our planet reveal the brutal result of our behavior. Our lives depend on the ocean and on polar regions. They are vulnerable, indicating change and human impact. This impact affects us all. Climate is changing, biodiversity is declining, sea levels are rising. Images are a powerful tool for storytelling. I document change for scientists, policymakers, game changers, and future generations. With shared knowledge, we can each play a part in making a difference. We can take action. Our very existence depends on it. Because nature is who we are. I'd like to start with this photo. It's titled Lost. During uh, many years in the north and south as well, and on the world's oceans, I learned actually that uh, indigenous people, they, uh, they are differently connected to planet Earth. They see themselves as an equal part and a part of Earth and of nature system. And we forgot that connection. Um, so this is a project that I did white out. You see uh, human beings there. Um, and the project is really aiming to, uh, to understand this connection because I think we lost a lot of significant knowledge that can also help us uh, to future solutions. In between man and nature, there is conflict. So this is Svalbard, uh, about 79 degrees north in the valley out of Longyearbyen. In June 2014, so you see no ice, no snow anymore. 
And then you see a natural a, a, a seal in its natural inhabited envi environment, and you see that there is a reflection. The water is water now, the ice has molten, molten, and you see the reflection of the water, you see the glacier tongue that is retreating. Now this is an interesting photo. You see in the middle of the photo is a horizon. You see a little cabin, it's like a house, but nobody lives there. It's used by scientists for research um, um, longer uh, uh, you know, expeditions. And then you see on the background, you see this rock, and the rock has been carved. This is clearly, it used to be a glacier, but no ice. So the same happens at the foreground. You see a piece of plastic coming up. Uh, you see a pellet, a tube. All things become visible when the, when the ice uh, and snow disappears. Beautiful rhythm in the water, but the water should be ice. This is 81 north. So that is like 900 kilometers from the geographical North Pole. This is still in winter. You see the uh, history of mining, a bit of uh, industrial heritage, and then some glacial ice with uh, uh, obviously some uh, ice coring being done. In ice is a lot of uh, significant knowledge. So you are the scientists, most of you. But I understood that uh, we can really read a uh, compilation of atmosphere and so on. So science is um, uh, quintessential in finding solutions, of course. Now, as you saw in the movie, everything started for me when I entered the Global Seed Vault. And the irony is that a couple of years ago, already due to the melting permafrost, there was a leak inside. Luckily, no uh, seed varieties were contaminated or like uh, touched by water. But so this is the door to the most important room for our food security, biodiversity for future, future generations, your great grandchildren. Uh, fauna, is, uh, fauna and flora um, is declining due to climate change. Now, I took um, this photo with an extreme wide angle, not only because the room is, okay, it's a, a deep room, but it's not that large. The complete, um, um, so I took it because you can already see that there are, there are cooling, um, um, artificial, there is all artificial cooling because minus 17 is what we need for the seeds. And 130 meter deep inside this permafrost, already it's only minus 10. So everything is getting warmer, the permafrost is thawing, and uh, water is dripping in. The complete, uh, this is the most complete collection now of gene banks worldwide of food varieties, and contains now uh, um, of 1.2 million varieties, and the complete capacity is 4.5 million. You see uh, on the left the complete uh, seed varieties of what is grow growing on the Canadian um, soil. So in the beginning they saw it more as a, um, a symbolic um, deposit, and then we soon understood that uh, it's uh, you know quintessential, essential to safeguard biodiversity for the future. And as you see, it also surpasses geo, uh, geopolitical tensions. You see the three wooden boxes of the People's Republic of Korea. This picture is titled Into Eternity, because we still discover species, fauna and flora, also plant species daily, on a daily basis, and we, uh, we don't know the, how much capacity we need, so we don't know if this third room, the three rooms in total, will be ever filled. Now, last year I was assigned to document, to make a database, a photo database, for the Green Islands, the Grenoye Oyen 2030. This is a roadmap in the Lofoten region. I was assigned by Lofoten Raude to document what is Lofoten about, but also how coastal communities are living in relation to the ocean, to water, to nature. So I joined for th uh, during three months on every level of society. I joined um, uh, fishermen. I understood that uh, there are only a few people left who can really, really uh, smell when the dry fish is ready. And as, um, as in th during the introduction was also told, um, the climate is changing. The cot, the, 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 um, the skrei, the winter cot, is retreating north, so fishermen have to get out really deep into the ocean. This man, he used to smell when the fish is ready, and he told me the climate is changing. The winters are getting, um, um, you know, more wet. Summers are uh, wet as well, less, less snow. Um, the quality of the air, the, the humidity, everything is changing. So I took a photo such as these uh, um, to, to show you how this is uh, taken on Rost, the island of Rost. 
And I show by this photo how society is re really uh, reli re reliable on fish. You see the, the stockfish hanging on the racks, and then the houses are actually quite far, but I show them also on the, on the racks. Um, stilt houses, people are really cl living on a very small piece of land near the sheer cliffs, and you see a, a, a threat of water, the water they, that they rely on. Then I also understood that uh, this is uh, on policy level. I understood that the length of the ship decides the amount of tax people have to pay. So they built the ships very deep, very wide, and not really aquadynamic. So this is uh, maybe uh, <laughs> something, a message that I want to bring towards uh, Oslo or something. <laughs> um, sorry for that. <laughs> Let me bring you to the other side of the planet, Antarctica. This is um, not only the first emperor sighting, um, which you never forget, but it shows you vulnerability, but it also shows a bit of a sad emotion. This is exactly what I want to bring with, through my footage, through my image. I want to evoke emotions, make people think as well. This is named the Penguin Party. Some Adeli penguins on a beautiful piece of ice. And then climate change comes up. And everything that is drifting north goes to warmer water, but also saltier water, and it's a process that speed ups. And the next crack is already there, visible. This is an Adeli penguin on sea ice, it's called La Solitude, loneliness. This is um, a direct way to show what is happening, because what I show you here is um, a piece of uh, glacial ice that has rotated 90 degrees, and before this rotation, I show you how water warms up really, really warm uh, and, and quick daily and cuts into the ice. Before it turned around 90 degrees, this is, uh, these were horizontal layers. Now I can take a photo of a penguin or I can take a fragment of a penguin to show you the beauty of this animal. It looks, looks like a Picasso. It's, look at the shapes and the colors. So I want to show beauty. People see, but they also have to look This is a fragment of the largest king penguin colony on South Georgia. I saw a similar colony on the French islands in Kerguelen and Crozet in the South Indian Ocean. I also made a book project that is uh, a dedication to the ocean. I sailed all oceans, uh, one ocean, but all the corners. This is a photo I took on the, on the equator showing the bluest blue that you can capture in a natural way. I'm a documentary filmmaker or a photographer filmmaker. So I want to show really what I saw. This is the bluest color that I could capture ever. So this is the virtue of a lot of patience. This is one of the photos I, I uh, shared with a scientific database, also this one. Flying fish, flying squid. When I took this photo, I didn't even know it existed. <laughs> <laughs> and here I show you how gravity pulls after um, like eight to 12 meters well, flying, but it's actually really uh, the speed that makes it through the lift uh, uh, make the animal possible to, uh, to traverse uh, this distance. And then it's, uh, it becomes heavy, it's falling down. And I showed how with its tail, it still gains a few meters. This is orca type D, quite rare, I understood. So marine biologists, they always get very exciting. So I took this at uh, uh, something like 55 south um, on the French Antarctic Islands the most remote island of the world, inhabited island of the world. It's not Pitcairn, this is Tristan da Cunha, and a population of 264 people. And I, I learned from them also this balance again in between man and nature. They live by the rhythm of the day. They have a complete different understanding of society and of their role in nature as well. So this is one stratovolcano, and actually likewise low photo, there is only a little bit of land to be populated. It's very, uh, well, sheer cliffs. And they have uh, two sources, potato patches at the right. You see this uh, little brown patch. That's where they crop potatoes. And then they have uh, an enormous amount of uh, lobsters. That's their only export product. So twice, three times a year, a supply ship comes. These people, they have lists. Like, you know, we need, uh, I don't know, medication, pens, paper, whatever. And so uh, they're patiently waiting. And then the ships, they come in, they bring supplies, and they bring out the lobsters. This is a history of whaling of, uh, on South uh, Georgia. And I understood that uh, whalers, and this is a story that counts for almost every island on our planet, they brought in um, 
they introduced uh, the reindeer. Reindeer all the way from Finnmark to Lofoten, north of uh, Norway. And reindeer, they were eating the same as the pintail duck. And when an animal doesn't have natural resources, it might become a threat. So I understood that this duck survived because it adapted itself. It didn't extinct. It eats also carcass, uh, carcasses, dead seals. And they also have a problem, as every island does, with rats. Uh, normally it's the, the big four, I, I think you call it like that, the rats, the cats, the mice and the rabbits. Now the, pi the pipits, there are only about 500 left. This is a very rare photo of the South Georgia pipit. It nearly extinct because of rats and now they initiated a deratification program, but it's very hard to extinct uh, rats. I also understood that the same whalers brought back penguins. This is a story not a lot of people know. So during my project in Lofoten on the island of Rust, uh, I was being told, and there were some, uh, still some uh, tracks, some traces visible. In 1936, they brought penguins north and uh, tried to domesticate them. <laughs> it's quite interesting. And the story goes that uh, there were about 35, so half of them, they just you know, ran into the sea, never to be seen again. <laughs> and then the last one was, it's a bit uh, dramatic, beaten to death by an old lady that thought she saw the devil. Because people in those days, they didn't know what a penguin was. The story of rats, again, this is Ascension Island, and you see a rock uh, in the on the foreground, which is actually guano, hence the color, hence the, that's why it looks like gold. You see all these birds, these are is the Ascension Island fregat, and it is com entirely extinct on the island of Ascension. It only survives on this rock. Why? Because of the rats. These rats are so assertive that they don't eat only the chicks, they eat already, or, or not only the eggs, they eat already the chicks. The same is happening on islands like Gough Island uh, near Tristan da Cunha, on so many islands. So this is uh, an interesting story. Now we also learn, uh, this is a research vessel from the French government, the Marion Dufresne, in the South Indian Ocean. So the ship always goes to anchor, on anchor. Um, so we learn from that, this is the way to uh, secure biosecurity. Kirgelen. Now I'm uh, still very occupied with a project in the Pacific. Actually, after this conference, I'm heading for Marshall Islands. This is a photo I took in uh, Kiribati, and I understood in the Pacific region that these people, they didn't really contribute anything to the footprint of what we call now and the effects of climate change effects, but they really have the largest impact. They live on atolls and small islands. Um, the only source they have is dead cor coral reefs, rocks to build a, a, a seawall. This is Tuvalu, the smallest, the fourth smallest island, and also smallest island uh, of the world. And look, when I turn the drone more down, this is the direct threat. They have uh, issues like coastal erosion and salinity of fresh water supplies to cope with. The only thing they can do against coastal erosion is planting mangroves, UN-based uh, programs. This is um, a very significant photo, I would say. The boy looking at his past and future at the same time, I really wonder what he was thinking. Because, of course, they have to import everything, which leaves a big foot step, uh, uh, footprint as well. So this photo is titled, Thing Before You Buy. And it's especially uh, maybe a message towards uh, abolishment of uh, single-use uh, plastics and so on. Tuvalu. Now, Ru, that's a whole different presentation. <laughs> this is, a, a, in brief, a story of ecocide. Um, so on a very short term, uh, half a century, they uh, excavated all their natural resources and polluted their natural environment to that extent that it's, uh, you can't do anything anymore there. So this is, a, in brief, a story of a family. Uh, they told me to go to uh, relatives on living on other atolls. A atolls. Um, hundred, year, uh, hundred years ago, they were at low tide until their ankles in the water. Now it's almost a knee. Palau is a very positive story. The pledge, so they understood by protecting, they can, you know, play a much more significant effort. So I also document science. It's important to be part of research teams. So this is a, zoo, a plankton net, and we saw that 300 meter deep, you see all the little colors, the blue, the orange. This is all microplastics, and still the ones that we can see with the bare eye. So oceanography, basis of uh, understanding water and uh, anthropological uh, carbon footprint and all other variables are measured in these labs. 
This is an Argo float, Argo initiated by the United Nations as well, very significant. I love this program for the fact, for the, for the fact that uh, uh, worldwide people can access these data. So this is also crucial to share knowledge and data. And that's why I want to thank you all for being here today. So thank you. Thank you very much, Christian, for that uh, beautiful and thought-provoking uh, presentation. We're getting towards the end of this uh, session, but I still have some more practical information to give you. Um, there are a lot of events here in Bergen uh, today and during the rest of this One Ocean Week, 150 events altogether, so uh, it's busy. So our dignitary guest will have to leave us now. Um, I would like to thank His uh, Royal Highness for taking the time to join us for this opening uh, conference and uh, to share his reflections um, and experiences. It's very inspiring to us. So all rise, please. Thank you. Okay, so um, a little bit of a practical information before the coffee break now. Um, here up on the screen you see now the, uh, the program for today. We will have sessions 9, 10, 11 and 13 going in parallel. I, hope, I really hope everybody has been able to download the Hoover app. Um, to your mobile or uh, tablet. This is really key for a successful meeting. Uh, you can, of course, use the, the web page and the program there, but uh, the Whoop app is, is certainly, um, certainly uh, to be preferred, and you can also uh, there see the other participants. You can interact with them. Um, there is a welcome reception uh, this evening at 6 o'clock, 6 to 8. It's in that uh, tall ship uh, just across the street and uh, to the right. You can't miss it, really. Um, so. Um, Please be there on time. It's going to be a little bit of a logistical uh, challenge to get people on, the, on board, but uh, we should manage. And this uh, vessel just came back from a 20-month circum circumnavigation on a Saturday. So it's been out there sailing and then doing science. It's been a great expedition. Tomorrow there's a uh, poster session here at 6 o'clock, and they put up the walls after uh, we end today. So please put up your posters tomorrow morning. And there should be a code uh, on, the, on the board somewhere matching your poster code. So uh, we hope that. And they're organized by the different sessions. We only have one handout uh, object for this uh, conference, uh, the, the Moleskine notebook with the ECVO sticker on. And uh, I hope you like that and use that. And note that in the envelope in the back, there are two drink tickets for tomorrow's poster session. So very important, bring those. Um, we also have a collaboration with the University of Bergen uh, arts students. So there are various exhibitions here. There's a video exhibition out there. And there will also be built a sculpture outside uh, in that room that we will uh, be finalized by Friday. So uh, we'll see how that develops. You can see it out on the wall there. And hopefully we manage to transport it in here. We, we don't know yet, but uh, at least it will be an image of the, the final product. And uh, the student will be inspired by what's going on here. And, uh, and uh, the climate changing and, and all that uh, entails. So, um, yeah, all the presentations um, from this meeting will be streamed. There is a microphone stand in the aisle of each meeting room. So to give online participants a good experience, please go to the microphone and stand there and ask questions there. It's important then they can hear it and they can see who is asking the questions. So it's really a good thing and really urge you to do ask questions, engage in discussions, etc. But please go to the microphone stand and get in line if there are many. We hope there are many people asking questions, if there's time. Tomorrow morning, the plenary will start at 8.30.
So please bear for that. There will be more inf practical information, uh, and there will be keynotes, and uh, Howard Broman, editor of uh, ISIS Journal, will be here to talk about uh, submissions for the special issue. So 8.30 in this room. Now this room, this plenary room, will be rebuilt into four uh, rooms where the sessions will be. So now there's uh, time for coffee, tea, on both sides uh, of this room. And uh, please be back w before the session starts at 11 o'clock. Enjoy your coffee break. <laughs>